Hello, welcome. My name is Jackie Gadapur Werns, and I am an attorney with the Chicago law firm Franzic PC. I'm also one of the editors of the blog Title IX Insights, and today I'm coming to you with this video podcast addressing Title IX training materials and copyright law, which is a topic that has been of great interest to institutions, colleges, universities, and K-12 institutions across the country since the new Title IX regulations dropped. Now, we obviously are gonna be talking about some really intense copyright questions, and although I sometimes dabble in um, helping clients with uh, intellectual property issues, I really felt that we needed someone with some serious expertise to help us to untangle some of these questions. And so I am thrilled to invite and welcome Ashley Beauchet, who is a partner at Patasol McAuliffe with extensive experience in all facets of non-patent intellectual property law, including copyright law. Welcome, Ashley. Thank you for having me, Jackie. It's my pleasure. So I actually, by way of a little background, I have not long known about uh, Patasol McAuliffe from when I took uh, trademark and copyright law back in law school at the University of Virginia. My professor actually mentioned Patasol as being the boutique firm for, uh, for trademark and copyright soft IP matters. And um, so I've long known of Patasol but I'm extra excited today um, to have Ashley specifically here with us because she has such a strong background in litigating in federal courts and across the country and before the Trademark Trial and Appeal Board. She's handled cases involving trademark and trade dress infringement, false advertising, copyright infringement, and misappropriation of trade secrets. Ashley's been recognized as one of the top lawyers for e-discovery in Chicago, and she's also an adjunct professor at Chicago Kent College of Law, teaching a course on trademark and unfair competition. And she's also the uh, team coach for Chicago Kent students who are impeding in the International Trademark Association's moot court competition. So very, very excited to have Ashley here with us today to share her expertise on um, all of these interesting copyright issues that we're facing in the world of Title IX. So to give you a little bit of sense of the background of kind of why are we here and, and, and what we're talking about. So as I know everyone knows by now, uh, the U.S. Department of Education issued its final Title IX regulations back in May, and they go into effect on August 14th. And we have all been wading through the over 2,000 pages of commentary and rules that the Department of Education issued. Um, but we have one of the issues we've been struggling with is the requirement to post Title IX information on school websites under the new regulations. So just specifically to describe what those requirements are again as a refresher, the new regulations require that schools post contact information for the school's Title IX coordinators, the school's non-discrimination policy, and then the big one for us today is training materials used to train the school's Title IX personnel. Those materials have to be made publicly available on the school's website, which the department intended to serve as a safeguard to improve impartiality, reliability, and legitimacy of the Title IX proceedings. So, in other words, they want to make sure that students, faculty, uh, employees, other members of the school community are able to go online and see what materials are being used to train the Title IX team that's going to be adjudicating and um, deciding Title IX cases. And initially, there was some pushback from vendors, uh, vendors who may provide training. Um, a lot of law firms provide training. Franzic definitely does. And OCR made very clear in a blog post that schools are not permitted to merely list topics covered or summaries of trainings, that the school is expected to post all materials on its website. 
And so one of the issue that we've been uh, thinking about when it comes to this is the need to obtain copyright authorization for materials posted. And what are the copyright limitations? What do institutions need to be thinking about so that when they're making these postings that they aren't getting themselves into trouble um, so that a you know copyright attorney like Ashley is going to come knocking on their door with a, a cease and desist or or some other type of demand. So that was really the impetus of why we wanted to to schedule this um, event today. And we are posting this on our Title IX Insights blog online as a video uh, podcast, but it will also be going out through our Education Law Insights podcast, which is a more general podcast aimed at K-12 institutions. Um, but as you all know, our Title IX Insights blog is aimed at institutions, educational institutions at all levels. So this is going to be a conversation that we hope will be very useful for colleges, universities, and K-12 institutions alike. So with that background, I'm just going to jump in and ask Ashley a bunch of really hard questions and, <laughs> <laughs> and hope that we get, you know, a little bit more clarity on this for our, our educational clients. So, so as I just said, the new Title IX regulations require our educational institutions to post all materials that they use for trainings online. And as I mentioned, many of those trainings are going to be purchased from a company or a law firm that has a copyright on them. So I guess the first question is, what copyright permissions should educational institutions make sure they have before posting materials online? So sure, in the license, um, kind of the best practice when it comes to getting permission to use any copyrighted materials is that you really want the license to be clear on what you can use it for. And your licensor should be aware that there's an obligation to post the materials online and that you intend to do so. Another practice that the licensee, even though it's not necessarily their burden, but they can do, is to make sure that the materials have the copyright notice that identifies the owner. Um, because that notice can become very important in litigation. So you want to be sure that there's a notice. And it also signifies to people um, that, that someone does claim rights and that it identifies the party other than the educational institution of posting it. So basically, you want to make sure that the materials have a copyright notice, but you also want to be very, very clear that you have a license and the license expressly states what you're permitted to do with those materials, including posting them online. Um, I would go to far, as far to say that you should identify the specific websites um, that you intend to uh, post the materials on, just so there's no, you know, to avoid any doubt, you know exactly where you can post those materials. Great. Yeah, no, I think that's, um, that's great advice. And is there anything else? Um, I know we've talked some about what steps could the institution take on that website to help to um, protect against any type of infringement that might be imputed back to them? So there, there's a lot of different steps they can take. Like most of the websites will have terms of use where you can add provisions about who owns those materials right in the terms of use. But let's face it, I rarely go to, aside from being an IP lawyer, I don't know many people that go to the terms of use page of a website unless they're looking to complain about something, right? So the terms of use are kind of like, a, in a way, it's, it's, it's a lawyer's playground. Um, or a complainer's playground, but it's not really where a typical user um, would go to get information. So there's a couple things. Um, they could add language, um, like right above where any of the material is going to be displayed or shown, that identifies that it's the copyrighted proprietary material. They could identify the owner of those materials right there on the web page. Um, so it's very clear that they're saying, look, we don't own these. These are used under license. This is who you should contact if you want to use these materials, right? The other thing that they could do, um, they could also provide contact information for the licensor or the owner of the material. So this way, you're not leaving someone who wants access to the materials or wants to reproduce them themselves on their own fishing expedition. You've given them all of the tools 
to go out and obtain their own permissions. The other thing you could do um, is what we call a click wrap agreement. And most of us are very familiar with those because we've encountered them all the time when you're doing an update to your phone or whatnot. And basically it's all that junk that most people think is junk, um, which are actually contractual, very important contractual terms that basically specify that they're agreeing that they're not going to infringe these materials. Um, you know, and you could have, you know, basically you could have them acknowledge the fact that these are copyrighted protected materials. You can have them agree that they won't download the materials or reproduce the materials. Um, and, and obviously, you know, there's going to be a little box at the bottom that says, I agree to these terms. Um, that's another thing you can do um, to try to just, you know, as a precautionary measure, you know, as I said, many people don't read them but it's something to kind of just offset any liability on the licensee's part. Um, and it'll also though make users think twice uh, because they're, they're not gonna know, for those that don't read it, they actually won't be sure what they've agreed to, um, but it at least alerts them that they're entering into some kind of contract and there might be um, some restrictions on their use. So that's that's another um, mechanism that they could use, and most of the click wrap agreements are enforceable. Um, you know, there, there's been a lot of litigation, just like with any types of agreements. There's litigation, uh, so you want to just make sure that it's. You know, we recommend having it come up in a pop up window, because again, that's an alert to the user that they're they're gaining access to something that they're that might be proprietary. Uh, but you want it to be reasonable. Um, you want it to be easily understood. So you don't want to use a lot of legalese. The more clear and unambiguous it is, the better off it is for you. Uh, and you want it to be enforceable. So, you know, you could add very specific terms. Um, you just want to be sure that the average user is going to be able to understand those terms. And you don't want to have anything unconscionable in there, like, you know, that just would violate um you know any laws in that respect yeah and as from the education lawyer side of the perspective too i want to you know obviously we want to be careful and make clear that um we're not chilling anyone's access to these materials or um you know we don't know i guess a ocr might come out and say you can't put any limitations on you you know you can't require any collection of information you can't require any agreement but as of right now, they haven't come out and said that. So I think this is really useful advice as far as, you know, what steps the licensee, again, the educational institution, could take to avoid violating licenses that are coming from the, the training providers. Now, one question I do know that that is going to be top of mind for people on that thought is, well, why should we care? You know, it's not our copyright. Um, what, what's the risk to the educational institution if some third party comes in and violates and uses the, the materials in an improper manner? Sure. So a licensee or the educational institution, you know, they could be dragged in a lawsuit uh, for contributory liability. Uh, you know, if a couple, and, and this comes up a couple different ways, like, you know, they Number one, um, you know, you can't ex exceed the scope of your license. So an educational institution, you know, putting aside even posting things online, if they use the materials that exceeded the grant of their license, they would be an infringer. Now, if they don't have permission, express permission to post the materials, they could definitely be also an infringer. So it's very important that the grant that the licensee obtains includes that the fact that they could post these things on the website um, and, they, and you have to button it up. You have to make sure that you're not doing anything when you're posting the materials on the website. Like for instance, there may be some materials that, and, and Jackie, you can stop me if Title IX requires all of them, but there might be some materials that don't have to be disclosed. And, and the license or the owner of those, like for instance, maybe a workbook, maybe there's a PowerPoint presentation or a deck that is used for the training and that falls within Title IX requirements, but maybe there's a workbook or a video that doesn't, that doesn't have to be posted. And so you wanna just be sure that you're staying within the grant because if you exceed the grant to the license or you, know, you, you use it in a way that you shouldn't, you can be held as an infringer or to have contributed to 
a third party's infringement. Yeah, you're asking me questions that I uh, don't know the answers to because, you know, the, the OCR has said all materials, um, you know, but we don't exactly know what that means. We don't know, for instance, um, how far that goes. Um, you know, I, all materials used to train, I mean, that could be all sorts of documents that I might use as the trainer to prepare myself or that I might quote from or, um, you know, other types of things like that. So I just think um, right now, what's most important for institutions to understand and, and what I hear you saying is that they need to be working hand in hand with the, the licensor of their training to make sure that they know what is to be posted, what isn't to be posted. And then also to consider options like you've talked about, about how they can help to protect against infringement by individuals who might be coming to the website um, for reasons other than what the, the regulations are intended to address, which is, you know, you're supposed to come there and view the, the training materials in order to look for um, any type of institutional bias or um, anything of that sort. So um, I think that's really, really helpful um, advice. I, there. Just so it's said, um, I don't want to assume anything like the, the, the educational institutions would benefit for the license to be written. Um, I know a lot of times, you know, you engage vendors and whatnot um, to, to provide training and whatnot. And it could be like a series of emails. But what I really recommend is that there's a written license and they really look at the grant and spell out all the ways that they need to use the materials and identify those materials specifically so that there's no doubt whatsoever um, among either between either of the parties, how the materials will be used and where they're going to be displayed. So you've mentioned a few times the idea of a limited license. And so I, I just was hoping to get a little bit more information from you. What is a limited license and, and, and kind of what does that mean? So normally a limited license, um, almost all licenses are almost limited in some way, but there could be a limitation on how certain materials are used, um, how many people. Um, we've all seen licenses, especially probably in the educational arena where you get a license and you can share the information with 25 people, but not 50 people. So there's a lot of restrictions and limitations that copyright owners will build in to, you know, because it's, it, you know, when you have copyrighted material, that's your business model, that's your stream of revenue, right? So in a lot of consulting work and training work, there's a limitation on maybe the numbers, how many copies you can distribute. Um, and so you, you just wanna be wary of those, or, you know, it needs to be a payment structure where, you know, the one through, you know, the first 25 people that have access to the materials, you pay this fee, right? But then the next one, you pay this fee. And it's the same thing with software, right? We, we encounter this as lawyers all the time, and probably in educational institutions, you pay by how many users. That's a right. limited, right? So you just want to be mindful that it could be limited. It could also be limited in geographic scope. Now that might not come up here, but you know, you you just want to be mindful of the limitations that are set in the license. Um, and you also just, you know, a lot of times vendors and, and trainers and whatnot will have a standard license that they use, right? Just as a matter of course, right? We all have it, right? As we start a business relationship with somebody, we have like a template that we use. And you really need to read it and not just sign it because you wanna make sure that you're getting the rights you need to use the materials as you need them. Um, and so just don't, you know, it doesn't matter if, you know, organization A, B, and C all signed off on that agreement somebody needs to review that agreement and needs to understand how exactly you're gonna be using that information to make sure that the license covers you. Yeah, and I know that a lot of the big um, organizations that are doing trainings for, for Title IX, I know Franzic for sure has, has thought through and you know, has, a lic has license language that the goal being that it does not restrict the ability to comply with Title IX, but I, I what I hear you saying, and I think it's great advice, is you can't assume that just because someone gives you a document 
that you've got the right to, to comply with Title IX. You need to really pay attention to that license language and make sure that it, it is in fact giving you that authority. Right, so like for instance, I always use the example because we have this come up from time to time where um, a person in an organization will buy a book um, and it'll be, you know, it's great training material. And it's like, what can they use from that book? And a lot of times it's not much. Like you can't, you can't distribute the book to the organization, even though you're not selling it and you have the rights, you know, you own that copy of the book, you can't just copy it and reproduce it. You need permission to do it. So um, it's just kind of being mindful of that, that you need to know what the limitations are on the license and you wanna be sure that you don't exceed them. And I think that's a good point with respect to kind of a, an additional question that's come up with the, this uh, Title IX copyright issue, which is, okay, well, I'm an educational institution and I um, have come across a great training on um, a neighboring institution's website and I really would like to use it. So I'm going to, you know, maybe reach out to someone I know who's at that institution and ask them, hey, can I get a copy of it? Or Maybe I'm even just going to go on the website and, you know, download it and use it for my own presentation. So what are the limitations that educational institutions need to think about that um, if they were to come across something from another institution or if they were to get a request from another institution, hey, can I get a copy of that, that training? So I think um, it's always best to have permission. This is one of the situations where it's better ask permission in the beginning and not beg for forgiveness later. <laughs> so it's, you know, if there was another institution that had materials that are tailored to your needs, you can certainly reach out to that institution. But the, the first question should be, who owns those materials and how do I get in contact with them? Because just because one institution has the rights and posted them online doesn't give you the right to basically pull them down from the internet or use them without permission. Um, I envision that this is, and Jackie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I envision that people are going to be policing the use of their materials, knowing that they're all gonna have to be online. Um, so I would, you know, and, and, and the internet's a funny place because if you use the same materials, you're gonna have to post them. So it's gonna likely get back to the copyright owner that you've kind of just taken their materials. So it's always best to obtain permission from the copyright owner. Um, it's just, you know, you don't want even permission from the institution that has permission. In my book, wouldn't necessarily be sufficient unless there was documentation provided to me that they had the right to sublicense those specific materials. Great. Yeah, no, that, that sounds spot on um, with respect to what we're dealing with here because yes, everyone has, to, everyone has to put up what they're using. So it does seem like there's a little bit more of a risk here um, that you would be found out um, than maybe with some other types of, of copyright use that, that happens in educational institutions. And, you know, and maybe this isn't so prevalent in the educational institution, but it certainly is among um, intellectual property owners and people who you know, I think for the, the trainers and, you know, the consultants, this is their primary business model. So they could also be looking on the internet and have capabilities to search for when their materials come up. So it, it's not, it, it's going to be less happenstance that they stumble upon an infringement. They're probably going to be policing the field um, and as they should be. So, you know, you could, if you, if you, if you cheat or misappropriate their materials, you should assume you're going to be caught. <laughs> right, right. Um, no, and, and also you mentioned earlier videos, and I know this is always a, a interesting question for me. We were, when we were talking earlier, I explained that, you know, when I do a lot of Title IX training and that um, there's this great video out there of, that uses uh, T to explain consent, like, um, in right. the Title IX context, and I love it, and I would love to use it in all of my trainings, but I know that just because I found it on the internet um, doesn't mean that it is available for me to use it, and so um, I don't know to what extent this, um, this requirement is even going to apply to videos, but let's just assume that there are some circumstances where you're using a video 
um, as recorded materials for purposes of training. If it's on the web and, and someone were to come across it, what limitations are there on them using that video? So again, they should obtain permission um, because it's just like, you know, everything should, let me just start with a more basic premise that like everything that is sought to be protected should have a copyright notice. And I know that this doesn't apply necessarily to the educational instit institutions, but it might, right? Because you might have somebody within your organization that obtains the materials or goes to a, you know, a train the trainer session and then comes back with the materials and basically does the training session, which is recorded. But you should also obtain permission for those materials, for the video recordings. Um, if someone is going to be recorded and you have to post it online and there are active participants, one of the best practices there is to get releases um, just to kind of protect you from posting the video online. And then anyone that wants to use the video should have permission to do so. It's one thing for somebody at home to watch the video. It's another thing to broadcast it and have, you know, 500 other people watching the video. So again, you want permission. Um, and if you're the one setting up the video, you want to be sure that you get speaker releases, participant releases, and people know that they're going to do their video. Just like Jackie said to me, hey, I'm going to post this on my website. That's fine. I might not be happy if like I, you know, she didn't tell me and I rolled out of bed and then I find out that I'm all over the internet. Right. <laughs> so definitely get permission from your speakers, but you should treat the video the same way. Okay. And, and that's true even if, um, even if the institution isn't using it for a clearly commercial purpose, they're not selling it, but they're in a way they're using it to replace going out and purchasing training to train people. I think it depends. I think that's a really fact specific analysis because if they have their own training materials and their own trainers, um, assuming that the people that are being recorded and their participants are comfortable with it, they could probably reproduce it within their own organization. If though they're recording, let's say a third party um, or using third party materials, they would absolutely want permission um, to use those videos um, with that particular trainer and or the, just the fact that the underlying materials are used because they're still reproducing um, copyrighted material that doesn't belong to them. Awesome. And you've talked through this a little bit um, already, but I think, you know, I think it is important to kind of uh, get get the details on it. So if there is a limited license on materials an educational institution finds online, what are the kind of steps that um, it should go to to protect itself from a later claim that it has violated copyright? So I just want to make sure I understand. So they have a limited license to use the materials. Well, no, they, they just find one online and they say, you know, I, I, I really like this. And you mentioned you got to get permission. And so I guess I'm just wanting to get, you know, the kind of a little bit more details about you're going to reach out to them. What is it that you're going to ask for? Um, what kind of so, clarity should you seek? So it's typically what we like, we do this a lot too for clients, right? Where we're actually reach out and seek the permission for them. So, you know, a lot of times clients will come to us and say, I want to use this image. I want to use it. Is there copyright protection? Who owns it? Right. So sometimes we even help with just figuring out who owns it and getting to the bottom of it because it's not always clear. Hopefully in this situation, it'll be clear. Um, but typically what you want to do is you want to reach out to them and ask them, say, Hey, this is what I found online. This is what, this is how we would like to use it. Um, can we have a license to use it? And then typically, you know, they'll say yes or no. And then the, in most cases, they'll present you with the license agreement. And this is what I was talking about before is that many businesses kind of have their boilerplate license. Um, and you just need to make sure that that license and the grant that you're getting to use those materials covers exactly what you need and how you intend to use it, whether, and they could have all the different restrictions, tons of different restrictions. And, you know, they may say you can't post the materials online. Well, you need to obviously have that changed in the context of Title IX. 
it may say that, you know, there's a limitation on how many people can, um, you can reproduce the materials for. So just those are the types of considerations, but you basically want to reach out to them and say, this is what we like to use. This is how we need to use it. Can we have a license? And I wouldn't expect that the, obviously because this is a business model, there will probably be some licensing fee um, that the institutions will be required to pay. Yeah, and, and I mean, that may be, and, and you know, I know too that people have reached out to me before to say, you know, we have a lot of webinars that are recorded on our website, and, and we've actually been encouraging people, for instance, to use our like intro to Title IX webinar that we did, one for K-12, one for higher ed that's on our website. We've been saying, please share this with people in your institution, have them watch it before we do our basic training, because then when we do our basic training, it's going to be, you know, reaffirming those things that they've already sort of learned. And so I'm really open with if people contact me to ask me, can I use that for something? I'm really open with it. If someone were to contact us about, can I show this, uh, you know, video podcast that you and Ashley did to, um, you know, a bunch of people in my school district, we, you know, it, it's not always going to be um, that there's a fee or that there's a burden to it. But I think the point is so important that, you know, you can't just assume. You can't assume. You have to make that extra step of getting something in writing that you can lean on if someone were to later say, you know, actually you use that without my permission. Right. And I think, you know, the other thing too is that there's a misconception that if you find something online, it's free to use. And that is absolutely not the case. Yeah. It's not the case at all. So, um, um, you know, sometimes there's language on websites or like Jackie just said, you mentioned, like, we want people to see this. We want people to circulate it. Right. So we're telling people that a lot of times on websites, people will say, you know, that they, they might say like, feel free, share this. Um, and there's other times where that's not the case. So, you just kind of have to use judgment. And, but I think in this context where you're talking about proprietary um, training materials, you know, you're going to need permission. And with videos, um, you know, unless there's an invitation to share, it's better to get permission. Um, because with copyright, too, the, one of the things I bear in mind is that there, there are statutory damages. So if somebody owns the copyright in the video, and you use it, you don't want to be hauled off in court and have to pay some kind of statutory damages just because, you know, you reproduced a video without permission. Perfect. Yeah. And I think, you know, people uh, don't necessarily understand that, don't understand what the risk is to all of it. So I know this has been really helpful. One thing I, I think um, this has been such a great conversation. I've got one more question for you, which is, if someone has linked to say, so like, let's say I give out a link to the Franzic website and I give that to an educational institution and they are able to just post that link on their website, then it sort of can push off on the vendor the responsibility to put language on the website that says this is a limited use, here's the limitations. So that might be something if, a, if an educational institution doesn't want to have to deal with all of these headaches, is that something that they could try to negotiate with the vendor to do? Absolutely, absolutely. Because then the vendor can put in its own safeguards. Um, you know, I don't know if Title IX requires it to be on the educational institution's exact website or if they can link, but that would certainly be a workaround. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know either. I mean, we, <laughs> you know, this stuff is all written so, um, you know, it doesn't have a whole lot of clarity, but I think, you know, there's a lot, there's an argument to be made, and I know some vendors are already planning on doing that. We've been working on it on our end, so we're hopeful that that's gonna be acceptable because it does take the, some of the responsibility off of the institution to have to deal with yet another thing. I mean, as if Title IX, COVID, reopening wasn't right. enough, you know, now you gotta worry about, am I violating somebody's copyright, right? Absolutely, absolutely. You no, know, so yeah, if, if Title IX permits it, that would be a great workaround. Um, obviously, you wanna still be sure that you have the license and you're using it for your own training purposes, but if that was permitted that that definitely would take the burden off of the educational institutions and put it back on the copyright owner 
um, to, to put its own precautions and safeguards in. Yeah, and I know that they, they will want to, to, to do that because, you know, we do care that, you know, our copyrights are, are protected. So it's a, it is, I think it's a good option, at least to consider until we're told that we can't do it. Um, so thank you so much, Ashley. This has been such a great conversation. I, um, you know, I'm not sure I'm totally thrilled that Title IX has thrown this, uh, this confusion on us, but if it allows us the opportunity to uh, interface with a firm like yours, with Patasol and with yourself, um, we know we here at Fransic are really grateful for the opportunity. Yeah, and Jay Jackie, thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been a really enlightening experience learning about Title IX. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Please definitely check out our Title IX blog at uh, www.title9ix9, um, so titleixinsights.com, and also our podcast, Education Law Insights, which you can find on um, anywhere where you find your podcast. So thanks, thanks so much, Ashley, again, and thank you everyone for listening. Have a great day. <laughs>